and welcome to the 2024 Windsor County State Senate Forum. Uh, my name is Ann Mixer. I'm a mem member of the Board of Directors of the League of Women Voters of Vermont. The League of Women Voters is a trusted national nonpartisan organization. We do not endorse or oppose any party or candidate. Our mission is to empower voters and to defend democracy. We have six candidates here this evening running for the State Senate for Windsor County. The League is hosting today's forum with Windsor On Air, specifically for you, the voter, to meet your candidates, hear what they have to say, and ask questions that are important to you. Now I'd like to call on Tom McCone, our moderator, to introduce the candidates. Tom is a former English teacher, principal, and library administrator, and writes commentary and feature articles for several publications. Thank you, Anne. Good evening, everyone. So our process tonight, we'll start with uh, opening statements after I introduce the candidates. Uh, they'll each have two minutes for an opening statement, and then we'll go through a process with questions. They'll have two minutes for each question also, and later on, they'll get to two minutes, have two minutes for a closing statement. Um, we have uh, um, here one. Uh, Devin in the front who will be helping me. The candidates keep track of the time because it can be hard to, when you're talking, it's sometimes hard to know how long you've been talking. But she's going to uh, let the candidates know when there's a minute left, 30 seconds, and 10 seconds, and when, and when it's time to stop. Candidates do not need to take the full two minutes on any question, and if you don't, we'll actually get to more questions. Big hint. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, we will be starting with a question, two questions from the League of Women Voters. The candidates received the first question in advance, um, and they don't have any of the other questions or topics in advance, so that's that. The uh, a, a real important part of this is we want questions from people here in the audience. Uh, so some of you did write questions on note cards in the way in, and you can still do that. Uh, Jez here in the front is helping to keep track of them and group them for me. So we don't, you know, if we get four people with the same or similar question, we'll, you know, we'll combine that and make one question here. So we have questions from lead. We have some questions. This is the fourth um, forum that we've run. So we have some questions that we've received before that worked well, and uh, we will use those if we don't have enough from the audience. So we'll blend them in. Um, other things here. Oh, so with six candidates, this the process here, the first round, we're going to go across left to right. And then after that, I put a grid together so that we're going to scramble it in each of the candidates. And out of the first six rounds, each candidate will get to go first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth each one time, but not in that order. It'll be, it'll be a bit jumbled. So, but it means that uh, the candidates will not always be going in the same sequence and will not always be going before and after the same person. Sometimes they will, but we will mix that up a little bit. And uh, for, let me, before we get to the opening statements, and the, the introductions are going to be very brief. With six people, I'm just going to tell you their name and their party affiliation in their town. And then uh, in their opening statements, if they want to share more about their bio, they certainly may do that. So, these in the same order in which they're listed on the ballot, from left to right, we have Allison H. Clarkson, Democrat from Woodstock, Jonathan Gleason, Republican from Ludlow, Joe Major, Democrat from Hartford, Andrea Murray, Republican from Wethersfield, Rebecca White, a Democrat from Hartford, and Jack Williams, Republican from Wethersfield. Sorry for saying those backwards. No, you have it correct, but also we're just inaccurate. You just switched. Yeah. Okay. You and switch? you might explain uh -huh. our seventh candidate. And Allison Clarkson and Rebecca White are both incumbents. So we will move on first to opening statements. And uh, we'll go through this, so we have a, we'll go through six, and then we'll repeat. So for the closing statement, 
Um, that will end up just being whichever have round hat for come up next. Okay. So, but anyway, we're right now run opening statements. So, and we'll start with Allison Carson. So you can go right from your seat, Allison. Actually, I'd and like to stand, stand. stand because we don't get enough exercise. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for putting this forum together. I'm Allison Clarkson. I'm the majority leader in the Senate. I have served in the legislature for 20 years, 12 in the House and 8 in the Senate. Uh, we moved to Vermont 33 years ago uh, so that my husband, Oliver Goodenough, could follow his bliss and become a professor at Vermont Law School. And we raised two sons of whom we're very proud in Woodstock, Vermont. Uh, before moving to Woodstock, uh, I was in the entertainment business in New York and uh, primarily in the theater. Uh, I'm running because I believe that at its best, government expresses our care and concern for each other and undertakes projects that, uh, that need to be common goods, common endeavors. We take care of each other in all sorts of ways, from educating our young, building roads and bridges, protecting our environment, to investing in innovation and workforce training, all things which enable our common good. As a Vermont legislator, I am proud to have helped invest in affordable housing development, further protect Vermont's environment, create a statewide ethics code, navigate the challenges of COVID, that was huge, uh, create sustainable support for childcare, protect our reproductive freedoms, improve gun safety, raise the minimum wage, and enact marriage equality. I hope to keep Vermont affordable and livable by fostering an innovative economy in revitalized downtowns, protecting our environment by continuing to reduce our contributions to climate change, and helping Vermont build uh, the resilience, resilience in the wake of increased natural disasters, strengthening our social fabric by supporting families, education, and our criminal justice system. I'm proud of my work in the legislature, helping improve the lives of Vermonters and protecting Vermont's environment. Thank you under two minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Next, we have Jonathan Gleason. Hi, I'm Jonathan Gleason. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you for taking your time out of your day to listen to us and so forth. I'm a resident of uh, Ludlow. This week was a very important week and exciting for my campaign. I received an endorsement from Governor Scott. So I was very pleased to receive that. Some of the things that he felt really made me unique as a candidate were, I'm a small businessman. I used to own and operate a small contracting company. Also, along with that, I was a union member. So I'm a very pro-labor person, but somebody who's looking at the costs, worried about budgets, all that sort of thing. My background is in, as I said, small business, and now I work for a large company in, at Okemo. Prior to that, education-wise, I have an undergrad in geological engineering. My specialty was hydrogeology and environmental reclamation. After that, I got an MBA, predominantly in finance. So I'm very familiar with budgeting, marketing, cost proposals, all that sort of thing. As a small businessman, I was fortunate enough to operate through very good times. Those were great. I was also fortunate to survive through downturns. The economic downturns really made me grow as a manager and as a budgeter. Those are the times when you have a hard time paying your bills that you really learn a lot about who you are as a manager, those around you, and also how to manage the checkbook. I always felt I could look at the checkbook. If it was going up, I'm doing the right thing. If it starts going down, I need to change course. I need to make modifications. As a very moderate Republican, that's what I want to help to bring to the legislature. Support for Governor Scott and a common sense attitude towards looking at our spending. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Joe Major. Thank you. First of all, I, I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, I've said this several times. There was a clothier in Western New York called Cy Sims, and he said, an educated consumer is our best customer. So for you coming today and finding out what we're all about is so vitally important. So 
I um, am a native of Buffalo, New York, and graduated from Howard University uh, in 1987. And I was a commissioned officer um, in the United States Army as well. Uh, I was a company commander of a drill sergeant unit. So right now, my wife is that, that drill sergeant to me. So I was hearing, <laughs> hearing her uh, 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 in my voice all the time. So uh, for about 30 years, I was managing health clubs. And I'm currently the executive director of the Upper Valley Aquatic Center. While in Hartford, I'm also the treasurer of Hartford and a former vice chair of the select board in Hartford. I am on several boards um, in and around the Upper Valley, which include the uh, Northern Stage, Headrest, the uh, Junction Media Arts, and VLCT, Vermont, uh, League of Vermont Cities and Towns. Uh, that particular board gave me the opportunity to see the conduit between municipalities and Montpelier. It also gave me the opportunity to see the issues that are striking our uh, municipalities as well. And throughout the Windsor County, one of the main things is taxes. And so we're going to have to roll up our sleeves, hopefully if you send me to Montpelier, and deal with that as one of our number one problems. I thank you very much for coming, and I'm, I'm looking forward to answering many of your questions. Thank you, Joe. Andrea Marie. So if you don't mind, I'm going to sit. Small back strain, so I'll... So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Andrea Murray. I'm a farmer. I'm a mom. I'm a businesswoman. Um, I'm running for Senate because I believe Vermont's at a crossroads, and we desperately need change. Right now, too many of my neighbors and friends are barely hanging on. And it's why I do as much as much as I can on my farm to help food security. The one bad month can mean the difference between keeping the lights on and losing everything. I had dinner right here in Windsor two weeks ago, and I met a man who, um, he, his home was foreclosed, and at the temporary shelter, he could only take one pet. So his five other animals, he had to find a home, which he couldn't, so he was devastated because he had to pick one animal and the rest were going to be gone forever. Um, it's all because he couldn't um, keep up with taxes. So families, have lived here, families that have lived here for generations are being pushed out. They're losing their heritage. They're losing their land. They're losing their generational wealth. And in the blink of an eye or a veto override, it's all gone. As a Native American woman, I do understand their struggles. Our seniors, they shouldn't be living in fear whether or not they can afford to keep a roof over their head and afford their medication. They deserve better, and I will work for legislation that makes Social Security benefits tax-free, completely tax-free. Um, I also pledged vote no on the um, clean heat standard. It, it's, for what families don't need more taxes, they need relief. Um, but it's not just our seniors that are feeling the pinch, it's our working families. They're getting squeezed harder than ever before. Um, I'll work to ensure that tax policies are fair and that working families keep more of what they've earned. We'll put people first, um, not the direct, disastrous political agendas of the supermajority it, he, that marginalizes our beloved Governor Scott, who is powerless to stop their, atta their attacks on Vermont. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> Uh, next, we'll go with uh, Becca White, oh. and then Jack. Okay. Oh, sorry, Jack. That's okay. <laughs> we need to switch places. Yeah, we can. We can switch places. This isn't amplifying. This is just for the television. Cool. Okay. And I'm going to time myself because I did debate team in high school and college, so I like to use a timer. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Rebecca White, uh, and I am your incumbent state senator along with Senator Clarkson. Uh, and one of the reasons why you see a pretty stacked deck of candidates is because we had a retirement. Senator Dick McCormick is not running for re-election, and we're so excited to have Joe Major, who he has endorsed, stepping into the fray. Um, you should know that when I kicked off my campaign two years ago, I did it right over there. We had a live band, we had great local food, and we had a ton of Windsorites. And that's because, and the reason I chose this town 
rather than my hometown of Hartford and the village of Wilder, um, and my family probably didn't love the commute down here, um, my brother George is here. He's right there, George. Um, the reason I chose this location is you are the start of the Vermont Constitution. You are where our government all began. You are where Vermont democracy kicked off. But you're also a location that has experienced extreme economic hardship. Um, growing up in White, right next to White River Junction, I have experienced the same downtown revitalization renaissance that we want Windsor to have and that you deserve. So for me as your elected official, speaking to you as locals, there are a lot of priorities that include housing, restoring um, our, uh, restoring how we continue, restoring the way that we fund public education so that it reflects the needs of your community, which is often um, disadvantaged uh, in the way that we support public schools. Um, the three E's are something that Allison and I have campaigned on quite a bit, uh, and that's our uh, economic policy, our policy on the environment, and, and equity. So those three E's really encapsulate the values that you'll hear from us. Um, two bills before uh, I let you go uh, is that I want to highlight that I worked on this last legislative session was the community nurse program. Windsor needs a community nurse. We need more of them. If you want to know more, talk to me after. And then the last is the Transportation Innovation Act. So thank you so much for coming and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Becca and Jack Williams. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the audience and League of the uh, Women Voters and the moderator. It's an honor to speak to you tonight. Um, my name is Jack Williams. I live in Perkinsville, Vermont, which is just right beside North Springfield. Uh, I'm married. Uh, my wife and I have uh, four grown children. and. Uh, We've been in the community for about 33 years. Uh, my wife's originally from Vermont, and I'm originally from Colorado, and we met while I was in the military. Uh, the reason I'm running is I feel it's the, do the civic duty of every person to support your country in whatever way you're able to, whether you uh, just vote or whatever you, whether you run or whatever you do, but it's a civic duty. And I feel at this time and point in history, it's my civic duty to run as a legislator for the Vermont Senate. Um, I'm retired military, and I'm retired from the state of Vermont, the Vermont Agency of Transportation. Yeah, in the military, I was responsible for uh, lives. I held leadership positions in the agency of transportation. I was responsible for big dollars amounts of money. And so I know what, it, what it's like to, to be responsible for lives and people's welfare, to be responsible for uh, the economic side of it. And so what you need in Montpelier are problem solvers. You don't need people that are problem creators and so on. And so that's why I'm running. I'm a problem solver. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, next we have the question that the league gave to the six candidates in advance. Um, and for this round, I'll read the question in a moment, but uh, Joe will be answering first, and then Jack will go after Joe. So, how will Vermont fund quality education for all students, given rising costs, needed capital improvements, and the decrease in student population? So, starting with Joe. So, you gave me the easy question first, eh? Mm. You can laugh at that. It's, still, no, it's okay, laughing. guys. We're laughing. Uh, this is obviously the, the topic that uh, is on everyone's mind. And it is particularly important that we have solutions for this. Um, one solution that I see is to tax second homeowners at a higher rate. Right now, they, in essence, pay a little less than 
people who have permanent homes. Um, that one, that is unfair. We have to look at that situation and decide that person doesn't live in our community, yet um, when they are in our community, they take advantage of our services without paying into our services. They take advantage of uh, hospitals and they take advantage of uh, and uh, take advantage of ambulances when when they come to, but they do not pay into uh, for those services. Um, it also it gives a, a, a seasonal dis um, impact on uh, the uh, the community. So during the winter, when we have to pay for plowing and things of that nature, you know that that builds up. Um, lastly, uh, if a second homeowner is not there, what does that do to the community? And, and how it looks. I, I go to a, a community like Woodstock where it has a definite uh, character. Does that character go away when the uh, second homeowner is, is not there? So, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Jack? A good politician should have his notes memorized. No. Um, one thing we all agree on is that the soul of a nation is your education. Another thing that we all agree on is we all want quality education for our children. The question is, is how do we achieve quality education versus cost? So let's go back to 1997. In 1997, that was when Act 60 was adopted. And that uh, Act 60 attempted to uh, um, equalize education cost. Okay, so in 1997, we had an education budget of, of $840 million. We had um, 106,000 students, and we had Vermont was in the top five of the nation for education. That was 19, uh, 1997. Today in 2024, we have 85,000 students less. We have a $2 billion budget. Right now, Vermont's education ranks at about 25, number 25 out of 50 states in the nation. So we've gone down. Student population has gone down by 8% and the cost has gone up 22% and we've added more people to the budget. Now there are three things that we need to do to, to get our education on track. I know I'm running out of time. Quality, edu quality education, we want to get parents involved. We want to elect Zoe Sanders, Secretary of Education. We want to disengage the Vermont NEA and the next thing is cost. Okay, well, I'll pick that up a little later on that one. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Allison is next, and Becca will be going after her. When you have two minutes, you have to use your notes. There are so many challenges that our public education system is facing, all of which we need to deal with this biennium. And I have five suggestions right off the bat. First, we need to support high quality public education at a sustainable cost. We can begin to reduce taxes by not paying for non-education programs from the education fund, like current use and tax increment financing. These are big programs that come out of the education fund. Mental health and PCB cleanup are not costs schools should be incurring. And I believe we need to continue to look at further consolidating our schools. I have hopes that the Commission on the Future of uh, Education will make significant recommendations for the legislature to act on next session. Second, we need to update what was once an equitable and progressive funding mechanism. Vermonters must be able to pay for education in a sustainable way. Vermonters cannot resent paying for, edu uh, paying for education, which is Vermont's largest workforce development investment. 
We must come up with a method of taxing Vermonters based on their ability to pay on the market value of homesteads, not of second homes. Owning a second home is a luxury and should be taxed accordingly. Third, we need to continue to improve the quality of public education and spread the quality equitably across Vermont. And we need to solve the problem of funding career and technical education centers, always in a tussle with our main high school. And fourth, we need to recruit more teachers. And fifth, we need to figure out how to address the billions of dollars of school infrastructure needs, which have mounted in the last 15 years since the state withdrew its support. This is essential infrastructure and maintenance of our public assets. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Um, Becca is next, followed by Andrea. Thank you. Um, before I describe a little bit of uh, what the cost drivers were that got us to our property tax situation, I just want to comment, Mr. Williams, I really appreciate your point around disengaging the NEA, which for folks is the union that represents teachers. And then I also just want to note, Zoe Saunders is appointed by the governor. It's not an elected position. So I appreciate both of those points, but I did want to highlight that I'm not totally following. And I really hope that one of the articulated positions that we haven't heard from our Republican opponents are what they would cut to lower property taxes. So I'm really hoping we do hear those points because we haven't gotten a plan. But this is what your legislature did when we saw the looming 20% increase uh, in property taxes. We reduced it to 13%. And I know that that isn't a jump for joy moment, but that's as good as we could do as a volunteer legislator with four months of time. And here were the cost drivers that we're going to have to address next session. A 16% increase in teacher health insurance is the main reason that your property taxes are going up. We can do really smart things with health care, like reference-based pricing, and lots of other ways that we can work to lower the cost of health insurance. That would be one of my ideas. We also saw an end to one-time COVID funding, ESRA funding from the federal government. That left this huge chunk of need for our schools that we had to fill with state money. That's a problem. We have to address that. Overall inflation, stuff costs more. Student costs didn't go down. If we didn't pay for the cost of that going up, we wouldn't have had functioning schools. Now, the last thing I want to highlight is that we have a commission on the future of education that will be bringing back to us recommendations. And I look forward to the work that we hear from them before we start to negotiate it out on the campaign trail. So uh, with that being said, I really look forward to hearing the proposals for cuts that we keep being told are coming but have not been proposed. Thank you, Becca. Andrea is next, and then Jonathan will be last. So let's talk about education. All parents want the best for our kids. Um, but right now, rural schools are being targeted for closure for the cost savings consolidations. Um, I believe it's time someone defended our local communities so that we don't lose quality education opportunities that they're entitled to. Um, it's not fair for families who have planted roots um, in towns because of great schools. The closures, based on arbitrary quota numbers, means we'll have to travel up to an hour one way to get or pick up their kids. And what if there's an emergency? Um, when it comes to sacrifice, it doesn't always, it does always seem to um, be expected from the ones that can least afford it these days. Um, so I looked at, not cuts, I wanted to know where the money went, because that was a comment I had made. So in Vermont, school board volunteers, school board members volunteer to create, manage, and allocate towns funds. They're not always um, understanding how to create a budget or to um, allocate those funds fully. Hopefully they get um, help, but results vary greatly in how that money is allocated. So I took a look at um, schools, um, how schools were using their money, their budgeted money, and I took Springfield and um, Hartford High, the Springfield and Hartford Community Schools. Sp they had similar funding and they have the similar tax rate. Springfield has 1,243 students. They have 93 teachers. So that's a I believe, 13 to 1 ratio. They're spending 47% of their teaching, of their budget on teaching costs. Hartford has 200 more students, and they have 168 teachers. They're spending 60% of their budget on teaching. And 
we, we have to fix the problem without putting more strain on families already stretched thin with rising taxes. So it's not necessarily at taxing more. Sometimes it's just making a better use of the money that we have. Our children deserve a bright future, and we owe it to them to get it right. Taxes, tax increase doesn't always equate to a better education. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. John. Education has always been at the forefront of my thinking. I was raised by two teachers. My dad taught at a high school and my mom an elementary school. So education has been paramount in my life. I feel as though maintaining a good education for our children is paramount to having a great democracy. An uneducated person doesn't appreciate what we have here in America. When I think about cutting the education in order to meet the budget, I think to myself, that's not what I want to do. The tax base needs to increase. One of the ideas we've thrown out there tonight is, let's tax the Flatlanders more, because they got <laughs> it, right? Yeah, we can all giggle and laugh about that. That is a law of diminishing returns. We can only push them so far before we won't have enough money to pay for what we need to pay for. We need to really substantially increase our tax base. So now we have to think outside the box. How do we do that? A few weeks ago, I went on a tour right up the street at the Windsor Jail. Been closed since 2017. Let's redevelop that. Right now, that's a big hole in the ground as far as the tax base goes. We're paying $250,000 a year to maintain it as nothing. Kind of cool open space, but the rest of it, the actual jail, it's costing us money. Let's turn that around. Maybe we could build a little tiny house community, house some nurses in there for the hospital right around the corner increase the tax base. Same thing in Springfield. When I drive out of town, there's a huge industrial lot laying fallow. Hasn't been used for years. Let's revitalize that. Obviously, there might be some Superfund cleanup. Need to get the feds involved. Those are the things that I think about. We need to increase the commercial tax base here in Vermont. That is the key to success. If we don't do that, the burden for taxation lies solely with us, the taxpayers, on our houses. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. So it would help us on time if, uh, we, if you uh, refrain from applauding after the candidates speak, and then we, you definitely will have a chance to apply for all of them later, or each of them, if you'd like to. But um, and the next question is also from the League of Women Voters. It was not sent out ahead of time. Uh, Jack will be first on this, and Andrea will be second. So the next question is, how will the state of Vermont fund infrastructure needs to mitigate and respond to climate events? So Jack first. Would you want to repeat the question, please? Yes. How will the state of Vermont fund infrastructure needs to mitigate and respond to climate events? Um, I'm going to assume that whoever wrote the question, you're asking about uh, uh, the infrastructure problem dealing with uh, with the flooding and stuff we're having. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the 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 thing about climate change, um, I look at it on different levels. The first level, you have to look at climate change on a global level. Um, at the global level, we have. Uh, am I misinterpreting the question? No, 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 you're fine. Okay. At the global level, you have uh, China uses over 50% of the coal used in the world. The next group of people is India, uses more coal than the US and Europe combined. So, at a global level, the big polluters are China and India and countries like that. So, at the global level, we need to take and have the, uh, the UN involved as far as climate change. Get some scientists and real people involved and put it in the UN. At the local level, um, we, we have the uh, Climate Change Act that was just uh, enacted where, where you sued, sue the state. Mm -hmm. Vermont has a very small footprint, carbon footprint, in, 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 in this. So at the state level, uh, we have a very small input in that. 
Now, as far as uh, dealing with uh, the flooding, we need to look at that at an engineering standpoint. We need to look at proper fixing of our dams, our waterways, but we need to get the Corps of Engineers involved in this. So this is how we'll, we'll solve the, the issues with the flooding, flooding problem. Um, so did I interpret that question like they, okay. I think it's up to you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Andrea, and then Becca will follow her. So for severe weather events due to climate change, we need to look at how we are using the money that we have. Once again, we have to review. Um, I'd focus on the five actions. They protect life, they protect property, and specifically the low income and vulnerable populations. Um, by reassessing our infrastructure policy to prioritize repair and re reinforcing the roads, the bridges, the waterways, that will better withstand any future um, nature events that come forward so that they are not nearly as damaging to um, our communities. The, we strengthen emergency preparedness to improve emergency response systems and the processes, which is going to save us money. Expand the capabilities and role of the Vermont National Guard for state and federal emergencies, and quite a bit of that is reimbursed, especially if there is a national emergency called. That, those are federal funds that will reimburse us for their services. Um, research and utilize the mitigation methods. What are historical practices? How did we manage and take care of our rivers so that they didn't overflow before? The, we need to look at cleaning up the debris after a storm and um, getting that waterway maintained and looking at the environmental impacts that that causes. When we have a, every year around my property, they come through and they clean out my ditches from all of the debris, the leaves, the trees, and, and the brush to make sure that my land does not flood from all of the um, natural, the storms, the weather, the traffic, the rocks, everything. So we should be looking at how to impact and how to clean that up with our rivers too. We can't just let it just pile up. When, um, <laughs> and we also need to maintain the strong relationship with our federal partners and make sure that we're utilizing all of the grants that are available to implement those solutions and maximize the f f money that's out there that we can use as a state. We're a small state. We need to take advantage of those um, benefits. Thank and, you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, next is Becca to be followed by Jonathan. This is the question that keeps me up at night is how are we going to fund responding to climate disasters like flooding, like Hurricane Irene, like the July 2023 floods? And Sandra Clarkson and I worked really hard on answering that question this last legislative session, and I think we got pretty close. We worked on two key pieces of legislation, the Flood Safety Act, S-213, which almost verbatim did what Andrea was suggesting, which is to look at how river corridors and wetlands and all of those mitigation strategies can be properly deployed by our Agency of Natural Resources and our agency of transportation. We also worked on S310, which created the Climate Mitigation Grant Program. And I'll tell you, you had two women swinging for you in Senate government operations, because what we heard from our municipalities was that direct money, direct support, was the only way they were going to be able to respond to bridge problems, to culverts being too small, to road washouts. There's a lot on that. But what do I think we can do moving forward? I want to explain two ideas. The first is that we know our gas tax revenue, which funds our roads and bridges, that is a decreasing slope. Thank you everyone who switched from a Toyota truck to a RAV4. You're reducing our gas tax revenue. We need to find out how we're going to fund our climate mitigation goals and just roads and bridges as we're currently maintaining them. So I'd like to work on moving away from the gas tax towards a vehicle mile travel and um, MBTU um, way of doing it. Uh, I also, uh, so that's the big one. And then the second piece I want to talk about is that make big oil pay bill that's been referenced. Uh, many years ago, we were told by the opioid settlement, uh, the folks who were working on that bill, that if we tried to sue Big Pharma to get money for the problems they caused, it wasn't going to happen. Well, now we have the opioid settlement money that's funding recovery services. I think we're going to do the same and hold fossil fuel companies for the, uh, the faults of the emissions that they caused that created climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. 
Jonathan is next to be followed by Joe. So when I think about climate change, global warming, what is happening to us right now as a country is the storms are getting bigger. There's more energy in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is heated up. There's more evaporated moisture in that same atmosphere. So when one of these big hurricanes stalls out over your location, you're really in for it. I was watching the news just before coming here, and I was watching the devastation down in Georgia and North Carolina. Absolutely horrific. My go-to answer for this would have been, oh, we just turned to FEMA. Well, the FEMA director says he's out of money. So then what? What do we do as a Vermont if that comes to pass? If it does come to pass, I would certainly be okay with saying, okay, let's have a moderate tax on something or other in order to build a fund to repair and replace what's damaged. However, by doing so, I want to do it in a way that makes sense moving forward insofar as I don't want to rebuild buildings that are just going to get flooded all over again. We have to do it in a way that's smart. We have to build back our waterways and also the estuaries and the areas that soak up the, the excess moisture and water that comes down, the swamps, wetlands, that sort of thing, and protect our forests. All of these things can help us so that we're not going to have to pay big money to build back. However, we do need to fix up some of the waterways. When I look at the waterways after the last storm, the rocks that sit in them went from being baseball, softball size, now they're like a small car. We need to move some of those, get the volume back. Without the volume in our waterways to move the water down to the Connecticut River, it's not going to work. Overall, when this water comes, we don't want our biggest export to be topsoil, because that's what's happening now. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Joe, to be followed by Allison. Vermont is vulnerable to increased flooding due to heavy rainfall rapid snow melt, and rising river levels. The lead to infrastructure damage, soil erosion, and risk to communities has seen tropical storm Irene in 2011 and recent storms in 2023. Just, can you hold on? To yes. <laughs> you get extra time. All right, thank you. Love that. <laughs> If you, <laughs> that's okay. If you, if you, you go to, yes. if you go to Cavendish or Ludlow or Queechee, yeah. you will, you will have seen those floodings. So what should the Senate do? Invest in flood resilience by upgrading its stormwater and management systems and enhancing natural flood defenses like wetlands and floodplains. Warmer temperatures have affected Vermont's agriculture as well. What should the Senate do? Support the transition to renewable energy, such as wind, solar, and uh, hydroelectric power. Implementing these policies and encouraging energy efficient greenhouse gas reduction, such as carbon pricing and clean, uh, the clean heat standard, supports climate adaptation and programs for farmers, foresters, and other industries. We have to promote renewable energy and energy efficient uh, pass legislation that advances renewable energy and reduces fossil fuel dependency on such, uh, such things as wind, solar, and bioenergy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joe. Allison. Thanks. I think everybody has really touched on some of the key pieces. How do we pay for it is, oh, is our biggest challenge. And FEMA as a partner is really a challenge at the moment. Um, I think Make Big Oil Pay, our climate super fund, uh, tags on to a, a tradition we already have in Vermont, which is a producer, extended producer responsibility mentality. We've done it with uh, tobacco, uh, <clears throat> the damage tobacco did to our population. We've done it with opioids uh, and with the damage that and that's also done to our populations, but we this it this suit would go directly to our uh, fossil fuel companies who have created in large measure the damage that we need to clean up, and it is only fair that they be partners with us 
in financing the cleanup. The state is certainly going to begin, and we're beginning with the resiliency fund that Becca referred to. We also need to build that resiliency fund for agriculture and for business. Uh, the BGAP program for business, which uh, <clears throat> came into play last year and has been so helpful last year and this year, business needs to also get back on its feet. So we, we need to take some of the infrastructure money that we're getting from the feds right now to do exactly the culvert, uh, the, a lot of the work, the resiliency work, we need to do more floodplains because investing in prevention and investing in smart resilience is so much less expensive than the cost of rebuilding. So housing needs to go up, housing needs to be uh, weatherized, housing needs, uh, and we need to become energy independent and, and really build our renewable energy portfolio in a way that will make us independent. But I think everybody actually had great contributions and I think together we have an answer. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Uh, the next question, Becca will go first, then Joe will follow her. Uh, before I read that, I just want to note that uh, questions coming from the audience, a couple of things is important to remember about them, is these are expressing the views of people in the community. So sometimes the question may come with a slant. It may be slanted in a particular direction, and it may include information that we may not all agree with. So it's not a comment on the question that's coming up, but just a comment about questions in general. Uh, because they're representing the views and concerns of people in the community. So, again, that's not a comment on this question. But this, this question from the audience here. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission stated a few days ago that the clean heat standard will cost Vermont's, Vermonters billions. Would you vote yes or no on this clean heat standard? And starting with Becca. Okay. I actually do think your previous comment does relate to this question because the Public Utilities Commission put out a, a part of a draft report on something called the Clean Heat Standard and something that the Republicans and a Koch Brothers backed PAC is running on is that the Clean Heat Standard, a bill that we worked on last legislative session, they are running on the fact that in trying to scare you into thinking it's going to cost you an arm and a leg for us to respond to the thermal carbon emissions that we have in Vermont. And that's simply not true. In fact, the opposite is true. Not having a plan to get Vermonters off of fossil fuel will cost us billions of more dollars than having a plan to do it. And the reason I say that is because something all of you know intuitively, which is fossil fuel prices just keep going up and up and they're extremely unstable. So while I appreciate the fact that we're having this conversation, it comes on a set of pieces of misinformation that have largely been spread by organizations that would benefit from continuing to be unregulated. So I would support a piece of legislation that moved Vermonters away from fossil fuel, similar to actually suggestions we've heard from our Republican counterparts here, that would help Vermonters weatherize their homes, get them to have heat pumps, and incentivize the lowest income Vermonters making the transition away from fossil fuels. Of course, we're going to get information about what that would cost us as a state, and I look forward to the final report, which will come to us in January 2025, where we'll hear testimony and we'll understand exactly what the bill does. So while I appreciate the question, I don't necessarily think, um, I, I do think it refers to your first point. Um, since I have 15 more seconds, I do just want to note that if you see some of those fear-mongering, older man shivering, the supermajority is to blame for your bill going up, Know that we passed a study this last legislative session. Nothing happened. So it doesn't make sense that they're telling you that we're raising your fossil fuel bill now. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. And uh, I do want to note my comments have led to the, just stating that I'm not taking sides in this. <laughs> I'm just sharing questions. So we have Joe to be followed by Jonathan. At the beginning of this uh, forum, I, I said an educated consumer is our best customer. It is what the legislature passed is a study so we could get more data, so we can actually find out what is going on. If we, can, we do not have the data to find out what's going on, how can we react to anything if we don't have the correct uh, information? Uh, no one, I don't care, elementary school tells you you have to have the correct information in order to act. And that's all this is. That's all this study. 
Uh, Becca talked about the fear-mongering postcards. I want you to do this. I want you to look at where those postcards are coming from. I want you to look at who's actually sending those postcards. And here's what else we're doing. When you look at who is funding that, it's the fossil fuel industry. It's the gas, it's the gas uh, industry. They are the ones who are funding this attack for this clean energy standard. Like I said, I, obviously I was not in the legislature, but I applaud them to try to get the data to find out how and where and what we should do going forward. Going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Jonathan, to be followed by Allison. So the Clean Aid Act, it's a very complicated bill, very complicated idea of creating a carbon credit market. What's going to happen is the fuel oil dealer is going to charge you more. How much more? We don't know yet, as my other candidates have said. Could be 70 cents a gallon, could be $4 a gallon. We don't know. They are then going to have to go out into this carbon credit market and buy carbon credits. They can't pay back the money in a normal way. It's not a tax. It's very, it's, it's, a, it's an idea based on assumptions. One of the assumptions that they're making is in order to offset these carbon credits, where they're buying them from, somebody's going to come to your house and they're going to help you buy a heat pump. You, the consumer, will then buy this heat pump. You're creating carbon credits that the fuel oil dealers will then buy. That's how they're going to pay themselves back or pay back for this difference that we need to make up for the amount of fossil fuels that we're selling in Vermont. I liken it to you're trying to drive a solution. And don't get me wrong, I like where the solution is going. I don't like driving from the back seat with my toes. I want to be in control of the process. There's other states that are doing this very thing, and they're doing it in a much more elegant manner. Mass Save, for example, down in Massachusetts. They have a simple tax on propane, on fuel oil. Those monies are leveraged with federal monies to help you, the consumer, get a low interest or no interest loan to buy the equipment necessary to make your house green and affordable and all of that. So I agree with going in that direction. What I don't agree with is the Clean Heat Act. As it stands, as I said before, I feel it's based on some bad assumptions. I would be a no based on what I've heard so far. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Allison, to be followed by Jack. Thanks. I'd like to remind us all that the Clean Heat Standard is actually, the act is called the Affordable Heat Act. Our whole objective is to enable Vermonters to transition off destructive fossil fuels in an affordable manner. We are not going to do anything that is going to uh, have Vermonters hemorrhaging financially in order to make this happen. However, climate change is the greatest challenge we face in this state. It directly impacts our lives, our businesses, and our environment. And we, uh, we are most threatened, and the cost in, alone in cleaning up is, it has threatened our, our, purse, our purse, the state purse. So we must do this transition, and the question is, how do we do it affordably? Mm -hmm. And that is what we're wrestling with. The clean heat that Jonathan did a very good job uh, explaining, that, that is one model that we have discussed. That may not be, it may be too expensive. On the other hand, all our fossil fuel companies are actually at the moment training people left, right, and center to install heat pumps and to install uh, the uh, the deep one that goes way into the ground. Geothermal. Yes, thank you. Geothermal. Just totally lost that one. Um, and so they are a little disingenuous here because they're also now making money, selling heat pumps, and working in this transitional market. So I would encourage us all not to jump to conclusions. There's a lot of misinformation about this. The legislature has yet to act on it. We will review everything we have learned. This may or may not be the model that we choose to go forward with, but it will always be affordable because we are all also Vermonters legislators, <laughs> and we want to make it as affordable as possible, or it's not going to happen, but it must happen. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Jack, to be followed by Andrea. 
I think this question is at a point where you're, you're going to start finding where myself as a Republican differs from uh, Becca, who's a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Now, I firmly believe in technology, and I support it 100%. You have to look at this stuff also on a global level as well as, well as on a local level. Now, I do not support the Clean Care or the Clean Heat Standard Act at all. I think it's a carbon credit scheme. I vote no on it, and I absolutely do not support it. As far as fuel reserves go, right now in the world there are gigantic propane, natural gas reserves, there's oil reserves throughout the world. They're finding them throughout the world. And until we have the technology to transition onto this stuff that we're talking about, we have to use what we have to transition. And we are transitioning. For example, we have, we have out in Nevada, I just read about the, the solar panels in Nevada. The whole desert now is being covered with solar panels. But on the other hand, we can't forget about things like nuclear energy. Nuclear energy would take a tenth of the area that these solar panels are taken. Same thing with windmills. You, you don't know what it's doing to the wind patterns. As far as these huge, humongous uh, solar panels, you don't know how much heat they absorb and the problems they may be causing. So we have to approach this stuff using the technology we have, the fuel, while we transition. But we have to have smart scientists involved in this transition. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Andrea. OK, I just don't know where to start, because the Affordable Heat Act not only passed, it passed by veto. And in that act, it says that the Clean Heat Standards shall be enacted. And not only that, it passed because some of the Democrat legislators refused to pass it unless they added a look back into the program, which is going to be effective January of this year. That look back said that they have a final approval once they have figured out how it's going to be implemented, if it can be implemented, they have to vote on the rules of how it's implemented, not if it's implemented. It is already a law. So it's disingenuous. The law is there. The article's there. So they're, they're assuming that people are not going to read these acts. They're not going to read these policies. And it's just disingenuous and it's improper to even um, address I'm very frustrated because that's just absolutely not true. And not only that, the 3.6 billion, because I read the NV5, 3.6 billion optimized potential, that's net societal benefits. So from a societal perspective, incentives that they're counting are considered transfer costs from the Vermont ratepayers. That's a quote from the thing, from the book. So the costs are you getting taxed and then you getting your money back as credits in order to force you to put this clean heat standard together. The net societal benefits include the ecological benefits of our road of not using fuels, the resource savings and externalities, whatever that is, um, non-energy benefits. Um, costs include measured, it doesn't count, we have older homes. Older homes need to be heated and insulated before these um, heat pumps will work. Massachusetts did a cost survey on the average cost because they have a whole home heat pump pilot. For an 1,000 to 1,500 square foot house, it's $10,818. They expect you to pay that up front. And if, you, and if your insurance doesn't accept a heat pump, you're going to have to have a secondary um, heat, heat source in order for you to be your home to be insured, then you also have to upgrade that. You're going to have to upgrade your electrical system because it takes a lot more electricity. Sorry, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> Please read your bills. For the next question, Andrea will go first, and Allison will go second. About 3,500 Vermonters are homeless. A few days ago, a group of 91 lawmakers sent Governor Phil Scott a letter asking him to use his emergency powers to help the people leaving the hotel voucher program. Here is a two-part question. What should the governor do now? And what should the legislature do 
when it convenes in January. So we start with Andrea. What should the government governor do about homeless housing yes. right now, when it convenes? Well, I'm not the governor, so and I'm not running for governor, so that's not a decision I can make. However, it is absolutely an issue that needs to be addressed. It's unfair that um, for us legislate future legislators, we are not going to be there until January. Um, so this needs to be dealt with immediately. What he should do is extend those vouchers until we can um, get a measure and get a plan forward and get something in place for these um, these people so that they have um, continued housing. Do I know that for sure? That is a guess because I don't have all the information. Um, that's just a first instinct. Now, um, in the future, I think we need to look at ways for more permanent housing and uh, long-term temporary housing. Uh, there are structures, buildings, the warehouse structures that we talked about revamping. There are ways to make housing that can be either transitional, permanent, um, temporary housing, where people that are homeless can, we can do a uh, multiple program. Um, that you need to look at housing these uh, Vermonters. You need to look at why are they homeless? Are there mental health issues? Is there a drug issue? Are there other factors that are causing them to be homeless? And we need to address those issues. And they need to be addressed where they're at. They don't need to travel long distances. We need to see how we need to mitigate those um, concerns so that they can become effective in a functioning in our society. Do they need long-term help? Do they need short-term help? Like the gentleman I spoke to, he was working on getting a job. He just needed a little while, a little bit of help. He needed some place to put his animals so he could get back on his feet and get, um, get a better start. So we need to look at what the problem is and where the homelessness is coming from before we can solve the issue. We can't just throw money at it and just keep pushing it, kicking it down the can. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Allison, to be followed by Jack. Thank you. <clears throat> COVID, of course, exacerbated this. We were so proud that we were able to house almost immediately the 2,000 that were homeless at that moment when COVID hit us. And we were able, as a state, to house them almost immediately because all the motels and hotels were, of course, vacated. And so we had a place to put them. That cost is now hemorrhaging us. So anybody who's concerned about cost should be very concerned about the price that we paid to many of these hotel and motel uh, owners, which was really appalling. However, we now have 1,700 children in our high schools and middle schools and elementary schools who are homeless across the state. The state has, a, the good news is, actually the state has the buildings to do something about this. Uh, as Jonathan referred to, we have the Windsor Prison. We have a number of buildings where we could set up temporary shelters and solve this problem at a fraction of the cost almost immediately. I'm proud to say I'm one of those 91 lawmakers who signed that bill and who signed that letter. And, uh, and, and I'm really hoping that the governor and his administration will be able to come up with a solution in a fairly speedy fashion that addresses this. Uh, the, of course, we, the problem is exacerbated by the fact that, uh, you know, people become homeless for a variety of reasons, mental health, opioid, domestic violence, a huge percent, and because they have lost their housing and or they have failed to be able to finance their housing. We must build more affordable housing. That is paramount to where, uh, with supports, as Andrea mentions, with the supports in them, because all our affordable housing now comes with support teams. So I, uh, I think we need to build more housing, but immediately we can house these people in state-owned buildings currently, and we need to be doing it ASAP. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Jack, to be followed by Jonathan. The problem with homeless, um, if you look at the root cause of it, you, you have people that are on drugs. You have people that come from broken homes. And this is a lot of the reason the root cause of your homeless people. Now, right now, everybody wrings their hands. You know, what are we going to do with all the homeless? Put them up in hotels. Put them up in parks with tents. Legalize more drugs. Build safe injection sites. That's the current solution to the homeless problem. Now, New Hampshire has what they call recovery centers. 
you can you can build centers in in every state. You you get a, a large amount of land, you build a center, whatever you call it, a recovery center or whatever. You staff this thing with medical facilities, housing facilities, training facilities. And this is where people can come to. All of your homeless, instead of putting them up in hotels and, and legalizing more drugs, they come to these recovery centers. And they not only ho house the, the homeless people, but you can have people that are on welfare come to these centers. In other words, help put lives back together. That's the purpose of these centers. Now, one quick point before I run out of time. If I'm elected, I'm going to analyze the state budget line by line and eliminate the, the waste in the budget. One of the things in the budget right now is a million dollars have been allotted to bring in the aliens that are coming into this country to provide them homes. But on the other hand, we don't have the money to take the homeless people, from the citizens of this country, and put them up. But we can budget um, over a million dollars in our budget for the aliens that we're bringing in. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Jonathan, to be followed by Joe. As Allison had mentioned, we've already spent millions and millions of dollars on this problem. Unfortunately, all that money is down the tubes. We have no legacy structures to speak of for spending all of that money already. So what we did so far is just a Band-Aid triage. Needed to be done from COVID, granted. We had some federal money to go around, that's fine. These are one of the problems that I would say we need to look at with a longer term fix. Homelessness is a pervasive problem throughout America. Every municipality has it, it's all over. It's not going away anytime soon. We need to strengthen the fabric of the social net so that these people don't fall through. We need to catch them, help them back up, get them on their feet. Immediately, if I were the governor, I would start to utilize existing structures, malls, buildings, get people in a shelter. These had been unpopular, but maybe now, push comes to shove, you're faced with either living in a car or living in a tent Living in that office building doesn't seem so bad, maybe. I'm not sure. See how it goes. I'm not the governor. We do need an immediate fix, though. From the legislature's standpoint, affordable housing is the way to go. We need to do it fast. We need to do it quick. There's a way to do existing structures. We can rehab those, turn them into apartments, that sort of thing. Or buy modular homes, ready-made things. Look for things that are on sale, find a good bargain. At least then, as a society, the money we invest into it isn't like paying the rent. That's how I look at what we did with the motel program. We paid rent. We didn't buy something. When I pay my mortgage, I feel good about that because I'm building equity. When I pay rent, not so great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Joe. Thank you. Well, I, the first thing we can't do is villainize the homeless. They are, not, uh, they are not villains. More often than not, they are homeless because of drugs and or because of mental illness. Two things that they have a very difficult time dealing with. So how do we help them? First of all, I, I would ask the governor to uh, increase the voucher program. I, I think we, we, we have not solved that, so I think we have to increase uh, or continue the voucher program. Secondly, I think we, ha we have to continue to, to aid services to, uh, for the mental illness and um, for drugs. We were, uh, Allison and I were in Bethel uh, recently uh, at an event, and the planning, commission, uh, uh, planning board chair came and he saw uh, a housing structure that was not being lived in. And he, he asked us, what, what can we do? And we said, there, there is a, a nonprofit organization called Twin Ponds. And what they do is they go in and they rehab existing buildings to make them affordable. Our job is to connect those 
things and make sure that we're able to get A and B together to solve problems. That's one way that we will do it, and thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. And Becca. Uh, I really appreciate some of the compassionate answers we got tonight. And I'm grateful to be um, amongst good company because Senator Clarkson and I were one of, we're both a, a, a part of that 91 folks who signed on to the letter calling for Governor Scott to do something now because we cannot act without a legislative session. But it is confusing to me to have such compassionate answers from individuals who have been openly endorsed by a governor who directly contradicts the perspectives that they're sharing on the stage tonight. So I really do hope with the platform that they have that they do call for the governor as candidates to react to this. I think that would be extremely powerful and I, I look forward to that um, <laughs> because it sounds like the intuition of folks at this table. So we did some important work this last legislative session to put in exemptions for low barrier housing and particularly motels, hotels transitioning to low barrier or affordable housing for folks who are directly transitioning out of homelessness. That's the kind of thing that we need um, because we unfortunately have localized planning that can dig its heels in and deny that kind of building. So then we have communities that are perfect for resource hubs but don't actually get low or no barrier shelter shelters built in their communities. So I would call on the governor to extend the voucher program and when we got into the legislative session, continue those exemptions further. Uh, I would also uh, just lift up the fact that recovery and transitional housing was another component of the work that we did, was to fund that. And it was something that was fought against by our Republican colleagues. So let's just be clear about compassionate answers without action at the end of the day. Um, and, and just in conclusion, I want to say um, it's, it's not just drugs and mental health that are the reasons folks end up in these situations. As a child, I experienced foreclosure. As a child, I experienced the tax sale of my home. We are talking about young people who the cost of housing is so much better of an investment than putting them in tents out in our campsites. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Uh, uh, we're almost to time. We're going to fit in one more follow-up question and ask you to answer it really quickly. Uh, but and then we're going to ask. Then we're going to move on to closing statements, actually. But follow-up question from the audience about the same topic. Um, so if you know, you can give you 15, 30 seconds if you need this on this. But some of you have already answered a, a related this in related way. Um, Twin Pines in White River Junction has recently opened. It has 18 one-bedroom units to help the chronically homeless. The price tag was $8.2 million, funded in part by Vermont Housing Authority. Do you feel this amount is a good investment of taxpayer money? So if you can answer this, is we'll go through the same order we just did, and I'll ask you to answer it as briefly as you can. You want me to read the question again? No. The point of fact, it's not state money. That $8.1 oh, million oh, well, dollars is not state money. I mean, it's we leverage. Yes. Anyway. So that's the... One of the points I made before about questions, we may not all agree on, on the content. But um, so, Andrea, would you start with that first? So, is $8.2 million for, for? For 18 one bedroom units. This is the number from the audience member. Does it come with a pool, a jacuzzi? Um, what are we talking? That, that's an awful lot of money. Why does it cost so much when you can build a house for, and I've spoken to contractors um, just two days ago, that you can build a house under $200,000. So um, it's, it's Good. Thank no. you. So if everybody could <laughs> keep up that same rapid pace, that would help us. Um, Allison and then Jack. So the state enables, it doesn't pay. We're not developers, but we do enable tax credits uh, and all the partners that put together that money. Actually, that was a great deal to be able to build. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly expensive right now to build housing. Uh, I have actually heard that the minimum is close four to $500 a square foot. So it uh, it is, Twin Pines got the cheapest uh, deal that they could get at the moment with uh, the, the challenges of inflation. It is a magnificent building, and we should all be very proud of it. 
we enable it by enabling a lot of the tax credits that go to the partners that create the housing and then finance it. Uh, we don't. We are not in the business of actually investing eight point one million dollars of state money into housing. Thank but, you, Allison. Yeah. Jack, and to be followed by Jonathan. Do we have two minutes on this or what? No, no thirty 15, seconds. Fifteen to thirty seconds. Okay. Getting back to this, this is the long-range plan. Build, build this for permanent. As far as uh, building that site or purchasing that site for eight million, that's probably a immediate solution. But you have a better solution. You have a person called the Vermont National Guard. They can set up camps, temporary camps that can house these people, whether they're homeless people or whatever. That is a cost-free thing. So purchase the $8 million if you want, but you have the Vermont National Guard that can immediately set up the camps. Thank you, Jack. Jonathan, followed by Joe. Yeah, I, I calculated it roughly. It's almost uh, $450,000 for a one-bedroom unit. Uh, maybe that is 1,000 square feet each. That would even be a lot for a one-bedroom. So I would say that that's very high. Uh, that's going to be 600 bucks a square foot from my way of thinking. I don't think it's incredibly worth it in that sense. It's directionally correct. Obviously, having that housing is valuable, but I wouldn't call that affordable housing. If I was now a younger person trying to buy that house for $450,000, I don't think I'd be able to do it. So we need to figure out a better way to build them. Thank you, Jonathan. Joe, followed by Becca. We've been asked to solve a problem. There, are, there may be better ways to solve the problem. Twin Pines looked at a situation and solved a problem. They have continued to solve the problem of homelessness and affordable housing by rehabbing hotels, old buildings. And, and, the, and you're looking at it in a, a vacuum that it's one year. It will continue on. So I, it, was, it solved the problem. And now we're saying, okay, it didn't solve the problem good enough. I, I disagree with that, and I, and I, I think that uh, it, it solved that problem at the time. Thank you, Joe. Becca? Uh, yes, I think it was a good investment. And I'll just note that I'm a Twin Pines Housing Trust homeowner. My husband and I were able to purchase our home using their first-time home buyer credit program. And we have uh, no down payment that we paid. So if you're thinking about that, it's a really good program. And yes, I support that investment. Thank you, Becca. So we're going to move on. It's uh, 10 minutes to 8. I have eight questions left. So how many hours do we have left? So we're going to move to, to closing statements. And uh, Jonathan will be first, followed by Andrea. Two minutes each. Hopefully we're given one. That's okay. One minute two. We can have two. two minutes each. Two minutes? Well, oh. thanks. Yeah. Appreciate it. So again, thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate you for your questions as well. Always interesting. I learn a lot during these uh, forums, and I've had a very good time running around in my campaign, meeting and greeting everybody. It's been a great learning experience from my perspective. What I'd like to have you take away about me as a candidate is I'm a moderate Republican, open to ideas, open to working across the aisle. I don't always agree with the Democrats but I do agree with the direction that they're going. Maybe on the Clean Heat Act, I don't agree with the premise of it, but I do agree we need to reduce our carbon footprint, we need to reduce our use of carbon, of fossil fuels. Moving to renewable energy is the right thing for Vermont. As Vermonters, we all wanna do that. We all wanna make the right decision for the environment. In regards to the housing situation, Creating new affordable housing for the next generation of Vermonters is paramount for Vermont's thriving economy and lifestyle. If the young people can't come here, buy houses, live, work, educate their children, we're going to be stuck with an aging population. That's not good for any of us. Insurance costs will increase. We need to reduce the average age of the Vermonter. We do that by creating more affordable housing. That really solves the problems that we've been talking about up here on the stage. If we have more affordable housing, we'll have 
lower insurance costs. We'll have more kids in the schools, thus reducing the per-pupil costs. And we'll increase the tax base, so all of us will pay slightly less. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Andrea, followed by Becca. So I actually want to take a minute because um, our incumbent senator took great pains in kind of attacking and kind of pushing um, the Republicans here, but she didn't attack her um, member of her self-proclaimed dream team about a comment that he made at our first, um, our last forum, two forums ago. Um, it, the new member. Um, has called the dedicated, hardworking staff who work for the most popular governor in the United States, he called them their, his minions. And these are moms, dads, members of our community, hardworking taxpayers, and I think it's reprehensible. Uh, it's, we're running to serve all of Vermonters. We represent everyone. Name calling and calling a staff of the most popular governor is never okay. They work hard day and night to support our, our state and this community, and I think that um, it's never appropriate, and we should have an apology for that. But aside from that, I do want to say, and I'm sorry that it just wasn't pointed out, and I think it needs to be called out. Um, our local economy is absolutely struggling. Our young people are leaving the states in droves because they can't find opportunities here. We need to focus on job training, local industry to create real lasting opportunities. We can't afford to lose another generation to places that offer more at lower costs. I believe Vermont's potential. I know that we can rebuild this economy and it allows our families to stay and thrive. I'm running for Senate because I know Vermont can do better. I want to be your voice in Montpelier. I want to work for affordable solutions. You can see that we already agree on so many things. It's about working together to find those solutions that works for everyone. So this election, I am asking for one of your votes because I want to work for us all. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Becca. Thank you so much for electing me two years ago to be the youngest woman to ever serve our state house as a senator. And when I was filled with joy about winning that election two years ago, I went to my mom and I confidently said, like, I did it. Look, there I go. And she said, yeah, you're great. Sure. But the people that are actually to thank for why you got to be elected were the people of Windsor County. Because it's not everywhere that we're electing young women. And it's certainly not everywhere that we're electing public school graduates and low-income community members. So I want to thank you and hope that I can get your vote again, because the work that I do is to make sure that the voices of the children, like the people I grew up with in Hartford, and the parents of those students in places like Windsor and Springfield, and the seniors throughout this county are represented by people who are able to represent them and be fighters and champions for them. And you've got two prize fighters fighting for you in the state house right now, Senator Clarkson and myself. If you want someone out there fighting for Windsor County to get a plan for that prison area, to get social security actually not being taxed, you want two people who are going to get out there and fight for you. And I may come on strong, but it's because I really care. And I want to be that person in the state house for you again. And I hope that you reelect Senator Clarkson and myself and that you add Joe Major to the ticket. So thank you for coming tonight and for taking time on like a Thursday evening on the most beautiful day so far this year. Um, and I hope you drive home safe. And thank you, League of Vermont Women Voters. When I, I reached out early on to the two groups to see if we could do a forum and you ran with it. And I so appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for filming. Thank you, Becca. Uh, Jack, to be followed by Allison. I think the question tonight that, that you need to ask yourself is, are you better off now than you were before? Do you want two more years of the same? That, that's the big question you have to ask yourself. All right, so right now, every two years, you as a citizen have the opportunity to elect a candidate or candidates who will represent you and also represent the good of Vermont. 
And that's, that's what's the most important thing about the election. And that's, that's one of your greatest civ civic duties you have, and it's not a civic duty to take lightly. Now, I'm not, uh, you know, I would appreciate your vote, but, I, but the biggest thing that I want to, uh, to say to you tonight is you've listened to all of us. You have to distill what we said. Think about, you know, do I want to hire those people or not? Or do I want to hire someone else? Now, looking at all of your faces out there, um, I'm getting some pretty glum readings. <laughs> so Look at me, Jack. I'm uh, smiling. I know, I know. <laughs> so the, the biggest thing is, is uh, what you sow in November 5, you're going to reap for the next two years. So that's what I want to leave you with, is what you sow in November, you're going to reap for the next two, two years. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Allison, to be followed by Joe. Thank you all for this lively and informative uh, conversation and forum. I, I, I think these are great and we get better and better. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to share our views and our values because our values are, 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 some of them are quite similar and some of them are quite different. I love representing Windsor District. It has just been a total joy. Every year I get to know uh, our 25 towns in a different way. I meet more people. I enjoy all the traditions in our in our towns and, and get to know our district's incredible natural beauty and natural resources. Legislators are not just lawmakers. We are active teammates working to improve our communities. We are problem solvers. Every committee in the State House is focused on how to solve problems Vermonters face every day. <clears throat> we work across the aisle all the time. We work across the aisle, compromising in policy and on bills in order to make progress for Vermont. 90% of our decisions are made in consensus, uh, by consensus. And so don't believe it when there's not balance. We do a lot of work to create compromise and balance. I am a team builder. I help make things happen and I work hard uh, advocating for my constituents. If elected, I will bring my energy and enthusiasm back to the State House to work on your behalf. I love my work as a legislator, and I'd appreciate your vote to send me back into the fray to continue the work that we need to do to deliver for you, the people of Vermont, saving our environment, supporting our children and families, working to keep Vermont affordable and livable. If elected, I will bring my energy and enthusiasm back, and with the values and experience I bring to the legislature, I believe I can help make a difference in the lives of Vermonters and in the well-being of our state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison. Joe, you get the final word. Thank you very much. And I, once again, I appreciate all of you coming today. Um, I, I will say this. I was the president of the White River Rotary. And what the Rotary does is they have a motto, service above self. Throughout my life and throughout my career, service has been what I do. In the military, service. My current job, customer service. And if you send me to, to Montpelier, I will be serving you. And I appreciate your vote come November 5th. I cannot, in good, con in good conscience, not respond to uh, Andrea and what she said. And she uh, particularly kind of went after me because she went after me in our last debate uh, about me getting affordable housing going forward um, for Northern Stage and workforce housing. And, and I think she was a little upset because I came, came back after. That's not the type, if you elect Republicans, that's great, that's fine. One question that was asked at a forum is, who did you vote for in the last election? She would not answer that. And she would not answer that simply because she thought that it would be politically damaging for her if she said who she voted for. You deserve to know because we are an open book. It informs you and in how we would go forward. I will also say this, I've, and I've said this before. There are Republicans on this 
that uh, I, I can work with. But there are some Republicans that are like a car transmission. They go backwards. If you see the, see the Democrats on here uh, on this dais, we are in drive and we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Before I turn this back over to Ann Mixer, I'm going to read you women voters. You jo join me in thanking Allison H. Clarkson, Jonathan Gleason, Joe Major, Andrea Murray, Rebecca White, and Jack Williams. We are delighted that you joined us this evening and hope this forum has given you the opportunity to learn more about your candidates for the State Senate. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Vermont, I want to thank the candidates for their responses to a wide range of questions, Windsor on Air for live streaming and recording this forum, our moderator, Tom McCone. Thank you, Tom. and you, our audience, and viewers for your interest in this election. The League would like to remind you to vote on Tuesday, November 5th. You may already have received your ballot, which is being mailed to all registered voters. You can vote your ballot early by mailing it to your town clerk, dropping it off at a ballot drop box, or at your town clerk's office, or taking it to your polling place on election day. You will need to re-register if you have moved or changed your name. If you want to know more about the candidates, the League has a nonpartisan voters guide at vote411.org. Every vote counts, and we know this to be the case in Vermont. So we urge you to make the effort, make a decision, make a difference, vote. Thank you for coming, and have a good night. Could we get a picture? Could we get a picture of all of us? Yeah, let's do it. That would be great. Two more to go. Ludlow, Bridgewater, and then don't we have one more?